On the bottom of the Mediterranean lies a ship from the time of Christ, buried in sand and shrouded in mystery. A ship with a fabulous cargo, a perilous mission, and a tragic fate. Twice it's been found, twice lost. Men have perished trying to unravel its secrets, yet now the adventure begins anew. From the seabed emerges a tale of pillage, murder, and plunder on a monumental scale. For this lost ship is the galley of the gods. There is on this globe a body of water like no other. The world's largest inland sea, the Mediterranean, Latin or middle of the land. 2,000 years ago, it was the center of the Roman world. Upon its waters, Roman galleys carried the cargo of empire. Three miles off Tunisia lies a ship that never finished its ancient voyage. And here, our own journey begins. The shores of this great sea have seen more empires come and go and more civilizations rise and fall than any other on Earth. From the Phoenicians to the Venetians, the one thing they all had in common was the ship. The story I'm about to tell you is that of the most famous of them all, the Mardio wreck. Off the coast of North Africa, archaeologists launch a search for the most important ship from the days of Rome. It lies almost 130 feet below, along with more than 200 tons of priceless treasure. Few even knew it existed. When it was discovered, it was hailed as one of the greatest collections of ancient art ever found. Twice in the past century, the site has been worked. One searcher ran out of money, the other out of time. Between them, they recovered a fortune in artifacts. Another fortune still lies somewhere below. Now, the trail is picked up by a scholar and adventurer from Oxford University, Manson Bound. Manson is one of the leading maritime archaeologists in the world. He has discovered 20 wrecks and directed some of the largest and deepest excavations ever undertaken. When Menson helped establish Oxford's maritime archaeological program, he was fulfilling a boyhood dream. As a child, I read everything I could get my hands on about wrecks. But the story that fired me most was that of a mysterious sunken ship from antiquity, near a town with the wonderful name of Madia. Madia was founded on the coast of Tunisia more than a thousand years ago. Once it was the birthplace of a great empire. Later, it was occupied by the descendants of Vikings. Now, it trades peacefully in olive oil, fish, and sponges. Madia lies on a slender peninsula known as Cap d'Afrique, Cape Africa. A few miles off the shoreline lies the wreck that now carries the town's name. The port will serve as base of operations in the search for the Madia wreck. Menson Bound has commissioned the former Royal Navy supply ship Millbrook to serve as the dive vessel. 
and he's recruited an international team of experts. An indispensable member of the expedition is Tunisia's chief maritime archaeologist, Ferry Chelbi. Other key members include Peter Winterstein, director of Deguva, a German maritime archaeological group, and Sumner Gerard, a former American diplomat and now skipper of the Millbrook. Hoffman? Yeah. Arnold? Yeah. Winterstein? Yeah. Shelby? Oui. A crucial member of the team is a dead man, Alfred Melin, the pioneering French archaeologist who first found the wreck near the turn of the century and left behind the key to finding it again. The team's goals are straightforward, find the wreck and map the site. But first, they must decipher Milan's clues, all of which have their roots here, in Madia. During the 10th century, Madia was the center from which the great Fatimid Empire spread across the Mediterranean. To guard their capital, the Fatimids built a hilltop stronghold called the Borge. Below it, the entire city was once ringed by walls 30 feet high. Of those great walls, only these meager ruins remain, including a fragment known as the Broken Tooth. This pile of rubble is one of Milan's landmarks for finding the wreck. Only one thing is certain about the wreck, its depth. Everything else will be detective work. Monday, August 12th. Fethi Chalbi and I try to piece together Meran's clues, starting at the Bourge one of the landmarks Merlin used to mark the wreck. Merlin's method was simple. Anchored over the wreck, he took three bearings passing through landmarks on the coast. On each trip to the wreck, he simply lined up his landmarks to find it again. The question was, were Merlin's landmarks still there? Okay, if it's going to be anywhere, it'll be out in that direction. Ah, you see it? Yeah. I just saw it, which was ridiculous. What Merlin saw from the wreck was a windmill aligned with an olive grove, a lone tree aligned with a small hill, and the Borge itself aligned with the ruin he called the Broken Tooth. But they didn't see a windmill, an olive grove, or a lone tree. The sole remaining clue is the Borge, aligned with the broken tooth on the farthest point of Cap d'Afrique. This is the tip of Cap d'Afrique, a tiny finger of land poking towards the underbelly of Europe. It's so small that it doesn't even feature on the map of Africa. And yet, by some grand geographical sleight of hand, it gave its name to the entire continent. During the Middle Ages, this peninsula was the epicenter of Fatimid Empire. From here, ships set sail to ravage the Western Mediterranean. They took Malta, Corsica, Sardinia, the Balearics, and even, for a time, Genoa. Now, all that remains is the Great Borge and a coastline punctuated by the ruins of massive defensive walls. And this, this is the broken tooth, the key to our search for the Mardia wreck. The trick was lining up the broken tooth and the Borge precisely. Draw a notional line from the corner of the Borge right here. Run it through the broken tooth out there and you'll have a transit that'll take you direct to the Mardia wreck. But if you are just one degree out, you'll find nothing but a sea of sand. Walking the fine line left by Milan, 
the team sets out to find the Madia rat. Tuesday, August 13th. The search is about to begin for the most important ancient shipwreck in the Mediterranean. We can go back in at lunch time. Yes, well, have yes that's it. I know this is very yes, quick, this ship. Have Hello? OK, Stuart, flash the dunk when you're ready. OK. In 1948, the fathers of these fishermen watched a little-known French naval captain depart from the same dock. His name was Jacques Cousteau. The fishermen thought Cousteau was looking for a fabled statue of a woman made of solid gold. They believed he would bring her back. Cousteau actually came here on a different mission involving a recent invention, the Aqualung. He put it to its first use in archaeology to rediscover what he called the most ancient wreck in the world, the Madia ship. Cousteau sent down six divers at a time, strung out at intervals along a 300-foot rope. Day after day, they searched without success. The Madea wreck was as elusive as the mythical Golden Lady. This team has an advantage over Cousteau, the global positioning system. As they move away from shore, satellites pinpoint their position within a matter of yards. Okay, well, from the boy, it'd be about 0 0.5. So, uh, 0 0.55. If they succeed in finding the wreck, it'll never be lost again. What's your course? First, they proceed to line up the broken tooth with the borge. In theory, they simply follow the line out from the borge and the broken tooth till they reach a depth of 39 meters, 127 feet. In practice, it's not so simple. The farther they move from land, the harder it is to stay on course. Their landmarks are now a blur. Turning! On the depth sounder, Menson spots an unusual shape on the sea floor. Then they hit 39 meters and the borge and broken tooth line up. Tuesday, August 13th. After years of planning, this was the moment we'd been waiting for. The treasures we had seen only in books, we were now about to see with our own eyes. Slowly, I got a sinking feeling that despite all our hard work, Despite our careful calculations, we might be in the wrong place.
Menson has no better luck than Cousteau. We made a pig's ear of our navigation today. Giving us transit opening, port starboard or whatever, closing. They're going to have someone on the GPS giving us today we had the GPS being reported in. Manson tries to figure out where they went wrong. The, uh, lighthouse and mm. figure out exactly how far off they were, but the angle is very That's true. shallow that far it's off. It's a very shallow angle, but we do have that. They had tried their sole lead, the transit line out from the broken tooth, and it failed. Before they can try again, they run into more practical problems. Thursday, August 14th. They spent all day yesterday searching, but not for the Madia wreck. They were looking for oil for the Millbrook. August 15th, strong winds, heavy seas, search suspended. We're gonna head back and we're gonna go over in the lee of Cap Dafrique. Till the weather clears, all they can do like is wait. Alfred Melan, the man who found the wreck in 1907, endured setbacks of his own. His is one of the most remarkable stories in archaeology. One day on his way to work as Tunisia's director of antiquities, Melan notices small bronze figurines on sale for a bargain. Milan sees their true value, their antiquities, and they're priceless. Selling antiquities is illegal, but Milan makes a deal. If the merchant reveals where they came from, Milan won't turn him in. The statues were found by sponge divers off the coast of Madia, a hundred mile ride away. Every summer since the time of Homer, almost 3,000 years ago, Greek divers would sail across the Mediterranean in search of highly coveted sponges. Held down by lead weights and simply holding their breath, they descended to 150 feet for up to three minutes. The Greeks are unsettled by the sudden appearance of a bureaucrat from Tunis. Milan turns on the charm and gets them talking. In the same spot where they found the figurines, the divers saw huge cannons. Milan suspects the cannons are marble columns works out a rough location of the site. In a remarkably short period of time, he's back here with all this equipment, plant and resource are on spot. And they send down the first two divers and they come back, nothing. And at this point, Milan starts to get just a little worried. So he goes to the captain, he says, look, captain, we're all here. I've done everything I said I would. Now you've got to deliver. Where's this ship? And at that moment, the captain shuffles around a little, studies his toes, and he admits to Milan that he doesn't actually know where the wreck is. All he knows is that it's somewhere in front of the Borge. Now, that is a big chunk of sea out there, right? I mean, it could be anywhere. And at that moment, Milan just flipped. He went absolutely apoplectic with rage, like the Queen of Hearts. He stormed around the deck. But you've got to picture it. It's like his whole career was on the line at that moment. So he starts to look, and he searches, and he searches, and he searches. And after 11 days, he gets lucky. He blunders into the ship. Milan's discovery remains the greatest trove of Greco-Roman artwork ever found. What he recovered would one day fill five large rooms of Tunisia's National Museum. From out of the sand, his divers pulled finely crafted statues, ornate candelabra, 
huge marble vases and stunning pieces of architecture. Such staggering wealth meant Milan had found no mere freighter. But where its fabulous cargo came from was a mystery. During the calm weather of five summers, divers brought up more treasure. Then, in 1914, Milan ran out of money. That summer, France had to fight a world war. Milan wrote, continued excavation would lead to more important discoveries. The cost of excavation proved high. A disease known as the Benz crippled some divers and killed others. Only years later would divers learn it was caused by staying down too long. When the weather clears and the search resumes, Menson limits his own divers to 20 minutes on the bottom. Saturday, August 17th. The team is now almost a week into the search with the same results each day. Still more problems. Now it's the engines on the inflatables, the only way to retrieve the divers. The expedition is running out of time. Soon, the sea will be whipped by autumn storms and the expedition basically, will have to be I abandoned. This, and basically, our terms of reference for tomorrow are the same as those of today. Go out there, find the wreck. Monday, August 19th. The Madia expedition begins its second week of searching the waters off Tunisia for an elusive wreck. Today, the expedition is charting a new course. Following the trail left by the first man to find the Madia ship hasn't worked. Now, they pick up the trail of the second. Late on June 20th, 1948, after six days of searching, one of Jacques Cousteau's divers saw what looked like a cannon protruding from the sand. It turned out to be a pillar from the Madia wreck. Cousteau lacked the training, equipment, and money to excavate such a find. After a few days, he left, admitting he had barely scratched the surface. He marked the site with a compass reading of the tallest landmark on Cap d'Afrique, a lighthouse, but never returned to use it. Menson Bound and Fetty Chelby once considered Cousteau's reading unreliable. Now, it's their last chance. On track, we're on track. They line up the lighthouse and decide to try their luck. They dive all day with no luck. At 6 p.m., the last dive begins. This time, they spot something.
In the tradition of mariners through the ages, Fetty and Menson offer a libation to the gods of the sea. And when my Nizar saw it for the first time, and he asked me, tell me, look, look, and we saw one colon, and two colon, and three colon. It's a wreck. <laughs> wow, it's a wreck. <laughs> we want to know the precise disposition of every feature on the seabed. It's time for a closer look. We are here three miles from land. We're 40 meters down. We have strong currents, and we have very mixed visibility. Before sending down the divers, Menson reminds them of the dangers below. I don't want anybody coming on cork on this one. And as for narcosis, the moment that you feel yourself floating off into punchy land, you stop. That's when you come up. And what we don't want are heroes. <coughs> Tuesday, August 20th. As an archaeologist, you're supposed to exercise a certain amount of detachment from your subject. In this case, it was impossible. I had waited 25 years for this moment. There it was, two objects encrusted with coral that looked like architectural pieces by first sight of the wreck. In my excitement, I was sucking air like a locomotive. I realized that if I didn't control my breathing, my dive would be over before it started. Everything was covered in a thick layer of coral, sponges, and other marine life. But I knew what I was looking at. Laid out before me were giant columns, capitals, and lintels. Everything you'd need to build an ancient Greek temple. These were no ordinary building blocks. Here lay an architectural treasure trove that only a king could afford. Perhaps these pieces were destined for some unfulfilled blueprints, or perhaps they came from some ancient temple. A wrecked building within a wrecked ship, a natural disaster preceded by one that was man-made. Three questions still haunted us. Where did the ship come from? Where was it going? And why did it sink? Now, the real archaeological challenge begins. Oh, it's fantastic down there. It's like a, a log jam of, of, of columns. It's like great big stone slabs. And uh, you can see them sort of going off and disappearing into the dissolve. Since the artifacts are covered in coral, it's impossible to analyze their origins. But Alfred Malin managed to raise several columns, now housed at Tunisia's National Museum, the Bardo. Tuesday, August 20th. Menson visits Habib Ben Yunus, the director of the museum, and Dr. Selim Koswath, its conservator, for a look at Malan's columns. Look at the size of some of these wormholes. Sea worms had ravaged the work of a master stone carver. In ancient times, when shipwrecks were common, marble was usually shipped in roughed out form. Only after it safely reached its destination was it finished by a craftsman. Parallel top to the bottom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yet, it's not the craftsmanship that tips Menson off. Very smoky in the area. The back of the acanthus is four or five on the side. While the carvings reveal the style, the stone reveals the origin. Very smooth. Such fine white marble could have come from only one place, 
the Pentale quarries near the Greek city of Athens. But why was the Madea ship risking such a fortune at sea? Wednesday, August 21st. The next step in solving this riddle is to measure and map every piece of cargo. To do this, the team will lay down a fixed reference the length of the site, called a datum line. Using measurements taken from points along the line, they can generate a computerized map of the site. We'll lay the datum line from here, from the anchor. It's going to be your job. Whichever way the datum line is fixed, Fetty and Menson take care to brief the team's newest member, Morak El Amori, a trainee archaeologist making his first dive of the site. Fantastic. So when I come back, Brian, I'll see if it makes sense on paper. The divers are limited to 20 minutes on the bottom to avoid the risk of the bends, the same hazard that claims several of Marlon's divers. A different hazard now looms. Morak becomes separated from his dive partner, Brian. Brian swims back to the Zodiac to find him, but Morak isn't there. He checks the decompression line. Still, no Morak. Then, Brian spots a stream of bubbles below him. Morak is in a daze, almost out of air and drifting toward the bottom. He has to share Brian's tank to reach the surface. It was a close call. No one said much about it. Morak is lucky. He has no signs of the bends, what we now know as decompression sickness. Decompression sickness is one of the hazards of the deep. As a diver descends, water pressure causes nitrogen to be absorbed in the body's tissues. Too much nitrogen is like too much alcohol. Reactions slow down, vision becomes blurred, dizziness sets in, and the longer the diver stays down, the more nitrogen is trapped in his body. If he ascends too quickly, before the nitrogen can escape, he could end up crippled or dead. Before surfacing, the team's divers spend time on the decompression line to rid their bodies of nitrogen. Thursday, August 22nd. Menson's wife and fellow archaeologist, Joe, makes a startling discovery. She finds pieces of amphora the earthenware jars that were the all-purpose containers of their time. It's a clue to the age of the wreck. Amphora of this type can be dated to within the first century BC. Everything begins to come together. Measurements taken from the datum line are fed into the computer. Now, the team has a complete picture of the wreck pieces of a puzzle, or evidence from the scene of a crime. Uh, what we seem to have a mixture of is columns, bases, capitals, and possibly pediment blocks. I normally, when you transport stone, uh, usually what they do is they just rough out the form and it's finished when it reaches its destination. So this, I mean, proves that this is from a pillaged site. Not raw material, but prized craftsmanship. That was the cargo of the Medea vessel. Pillaged from some unknown site, these columns were meant for some unknown destination. 
Since these pieces were quarried near Athens, they were probably looted from a Greek site, possibly in the first century BC, judging from the age of the amphora found among the wreckage. The next clue comes from the treasure raised by Melan and now housed in the vaults of the Bardo. The collection includes fine works of art and statues of gods, the kind that would adorn a place of worship. Such sacred pieces would never be freely surrendered, and they weren't. Investigators from the Rheinisches Landesmuseum in Bonn, Germany, have discovered several statues were ripped from their pedestals. On a statue of the Greek god Argon are pieces of lead from its base. Lead was also found on the base of the famous Herm of Dionysus, as well as pieces of stone from its pedestal. All the evidence points to one conclusion. This ill-gotten cargo was gained in some ancient act of grand theft. With time to kill on the decompression line, Menson catches up with Plutarch, one of the great chroniclers of ancient Greece and Rome. Plutarch comes through. From these pages emerges an epic tale of revolution and retribution, of greed, murder, and plunder. Now, the search moves from Madea on the coast of Africa to the Greek city of Athens. In 88 BC, Athens is governed by Rome, but Rome is racked by civil war. The Athenians revolt and massacre thousands of Greeks loyal to Rome. Yet the rebels' victory is short-lived. Within a year, Rome's civil war is over, and the general who ended it is marching on Athens. Lucius Cornelius Sulla, brilliant, efficient, and ruthless, even by Roman standards. It said, Sulla follows good beginnings with evil deeds. Athens is surrounded, cut off from help, yet defended by stout walls. For months, they withstand the battering of rams and catapults. Where the fighting was heaviest, recent excavations have turned up Sulla's missiles. Athens stands firm, but as food runs out, citizens grow desperate. Some resort to cannibalism. Starving, weak, and weary, they brace for the end. First of March, 86 BC. Sulla's men breach the wall. They rush through the city streets, putting everyone to the sword. Men, women, and children were massacred without mercy. Plutarch describes how rivers of blood ran through these streets. So did Sulla's men. Rome hadn't paid them, so Sulla turned them loose to pillage the city. They ripped artwork and statues right from their bases. And Sulla did likewise. But this art collector set his sights much higher upon one of the greatest treasures in all of Athens. And that's when Sulla's men came here. These are the ruins of one of the greatest structures of the ancient world, the Temple of Olympian Zeus, built by the Greeks to honor their highest god. No one is certain how it once looked, but the Greek philosopher Aristotle ranked the temple alongside the pyramids as one of the seven wonders of the world. Thousands of tons of the world's finest marble was hauled from 12 miles away, then shaped by hundreds of craftsmen. They labored for more than 600 years, yet even then the temple was never completed. 
It was held up by 104 huge marble columns. And one by one, when Athens fell, they were removed. When Sulla was finished, the few columns left held up only sky. These are the Pentalic quarries of Athens, source of the marble columns that Sulla coveted. The Roman historian Pliny writes that Sulla meant to take the Greek temple back to Italy to grace a Roman hilltop. But now he had a problem how to get such a dead weight of rock all the way to Rome. Rome lay some 1,500 miles away by land. In those days, transportation consisted of ox-drawn carts. Roads were few or non-existent. And the mountains were as high and as daunting as ever. There was only one way to do it haul the pieces of the temple a mere six miles to the port of Piraeus. Sulla would get his loot out by sea. After three more years of victories against the Greeks, Sulla returned to Rome. But one of his ships, laden with the glories of Greece, wasn't waiting for him. It ended up on the bottom of the Mediterranean. The final question remains, what happened? A treasure ship lies on the bottom of the Mediterranean. Why it sank is the mystery to be solved. Was it the victim of bad weather, bad sailing, or bad construction? To find the answer, the Madia team moves its investigation back in time. They decide to rebuild the very ship itself. Like the shipbuilders themselves, they start with the keel, the backbone of the vessel. This narrow line is the keel, but a large piece of it is missing. It was brought up in an earlier excavation, but for half a century it lay forgotten in the basement of the Bardo. Most of the ship's timbers have long since rotted away. Of a vessel built 2,000 years ago, only a few fragments survive. To most people, it's just an old piece of wood. But for Menson Bound, it holds clues to the construction of the Madia vessel. Well, this is not a bronze name. It's uh, displaced. Uh, yes. yes, this is the bronze nail. Missing its point. Yeah. Yes. They find a piece of a bronze nail and a trenel, one of the many hardwood pegs that held the ship together. From these fragments, Menson begins the process of rebuilding the Madia ship. This screen here, yeah. Okay, this the wooden peg gives Menson a clue to the construction of the hull. That was raised by one of the early investigators. Now look at that, there's two bits of information there straight away. We know from this that she was double planked. We have this rebate here and that rebate there, rabbits we call them. So one layer of planking up like that, the other layer like that. And the other thing it tells us is that she was of mortise and tenon construction. A mortise is a slot cut in the edge of a plank to receive the tongue-shaped tenon. The two-inch thick planks were then securely fastened with hardwood pegs. Next, the vessel was double planked with a thinner outer layer and sheathed in lead below the waterline. It was classic shipbuilding. This is how construction would have proceeded. First, builders laid down the keel, then the stem and stern posts at each end. Upward from the keel rose the ship's ribs or frames. The stern was rounded, so that in a following sea, waves would pass by on each side. The vessel was steered by two broad rudders. Based on the length of the keel, Menson can determine the overall length of the ship 
about 110 feet. She was about 27 feet wide, and she was likely powered by a set of four sails. She may have mounted a goosehead on the stern, indicating she was a merchant ship. In her hold, Sula's men loaded 66 columns weighing 200 tons, along with 30 tons of capitals, bases, and artifacts. A modern rule of thumb is to never load a ship above two-thirds of its capacity. No one knows the capacity of the Medea ship, only that she was dangerously overloaded. Weighed down with loot and dread, the crew put to sea. The crew would have had little relish for the voyage ahead, but they would have known that this broad-bowed ship with its gut load of rock was no flyer. To reach Rome, she'd have had to shove and bludgeon away across three seas, as well as pass through the treacherous Straits of Messina. The crew faced a journey of 800 miles across mostly uncharted waters, with no instruments of navigation to guide them. All they could rely on were the sun by day, the stars by night, and a lump of lead on a long line. This crude method of measuring the sea's depth kept ships from running aground. But the greatest threat to this vessel lay in her own hold. The first century BC. Loaded down with Greek treasure, the Medea ship set sail from Athens. Leaving the Aegean Sea, the captain would have crossed the Mediterranean to Italy intending to hug the coast till he could cut through the Straits of Messina to Rome. He almost made it. But somewhere en route, something went wrong. Perhaps a storm blew up. With the ship riding low on swelling seas, it would have been dangerous to sail in any direction except with the wind and the wind was blowing her off course. After losing sight of land, the crew once more found it. Except now, they weren't in Europe, but Africa, being slowly driven toward the rocky coast of Medea. The crew cast off the anchors from the stern. If she could just ride out the storm, she might make it. Then, catastrophe struck. She was dragged down by her own cargo, treasure pillaged from Greek gods. And the gods were avenged. Those who searched for the Medea treasure have been luckier than those who seized it. Years after his landmark discovery, Alfred Milan returned to Paris and became a curator of one of the world's greatest museums, the Louvre. After diving the Medea wreck, Jacques Cousteau spent the next half century exploring the world's oceans and became as famous for his own discoveries as Columbus himself. Still, the Medea tale is a story of unfinished business. A Roman plunderer who never got his loot. A ship that never reached its destination. And 
an archaeologist who must cut short his search. With summer waning, the expedition heads home before they face the same storms that sank the Medea ship. Another summer, they'll be back. No one knows what treasures still lie buried under the Mediterranean sands. But Jacques Cousteau's verdict on the Medea ship still rings true. There are many more secrets waiting to be revealed, he wrote. We were merely scratching at history's door.